Welcome to the TCS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week, we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration, and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello, my name is Shalai Tambo, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. I'm a lecturer in early childhood studies at Bath Spa University and an associate lecturer at the Open University. I'm a trustee for the Fathered Institute and also an independent writer and speaker for Critical Early Years. Now, throughout this series, we'll be exploring representation in the early years, inspiring you with guidance on ways to be more inclusive in your practice. And I am delighted to introduce Kerry Murphy as today's guest. So as part of this discussion, Kerry, it would be great if you could share some practical suggestions and new perspectives to help educators and families understand those different ways to support diverse child development. Brilliant. Okay, so some of the things that I commonly share when I am out on my travels with settings and and doing um, different trainings is I often start with um, taking a celebratory approach to neurodiversity. Now, this originates from the work of Penn Green, who are an amazing research centre. They've done some phenomenal work around developmental differences, and they've also worked with the Department for Education to produce some tools that every setting should have a copy of this within their setting. Um, So it is the celebratory approach to assessment for children traditionally identified as special educational needs. So inspired by that, I developed a tool called a celebratory um, approach or framework, whichever, whichever terminology you prefer. And basically it is about beginning to challenge that deficit narrative of um, neurodivergence. And it's about encouraging more holistic based discussions around children's development. So I mentioned it in the previous podcast So it's not about more paperwork because we've got enough of that within SEND support systems, but it's about a framework for thinking. So so a a kind of commitment that I make to myself in any conversation that I have about a child with developmental differences, I use this framework for thinking. Um, And so when I'm having a conversation, I will always talk about um, the child's interests as a starting point because that is part of our earliest pedagogy. So what is the child interested in? What are they motivated by? Where will you find them when you are in the setting. It's important to highlight there that the interests don't need to make sense to you yet. And what I mean by that is we often see neurodivergent children playing and acting in ways that are not neurotypical. So it's about making sure that we still value actually the way they do things is valid. So it's recognizing their interests. It's thinking about their strengths. Um, Something that I've noticed, particularly when I worked in local authority, is that whenever I would speak to educators about a child, uh, a neurodivergent child's strengths, there would sometimes be that response of there aren't any. And I think that's sometimes because you are lost in that deficit narrative. And if you can't think of a child's strengths, you're not identifying them, speak to others around that child. Speak to the parents, the family, speak to other colleagues. Every child has their unique strengths. Then think about their traits. And I'll come on to this in more detail in the next practical strategy. But rather than thinking about their their um, neurodivergence as a set of symptoms, think about the traits that they have. So think about how they are within the setting and frame it as the different traits. So for example, delayed echolalia, engages in stimming, prefers solitary play. Then think about how they do things differently rather than in a delayed way. So if, for example, you've got a non-speaking or a minimally speaking child, rather than going, well, they're not using speech, so therefore they're not meeting milestones. Actually, how do they communicate with you? How do they let you know that they are experiencing joy? How do they express a need? So think about differences rather than delays. And then one of the big misconceptions that arises within neurodiversity is that we only focus on the positive. That's not accurate at all. Neurodiversity recognizes that neurodivergent and disabled children have specific needs, but we recognize them in a bigger kind of patchwork of our understanding. 
This is where I do rely on policy-driven documents. So um, I actually really rate the four broad areas of needs that is in the 0 to 25 cent code of practice. And I always think about children's needs in terms of what are their primary and secondary needs. I find that that makes it manageable in terms of what I'm then going to plan for that child. Um, and rather than kind of prescribing to early intervention, I, I prescribe to the idea of early support. And so I think about what are their communication and interaction needs needs, what are their social, emotional and or mental health needs, what are their cognition and learning needs or their physical and or sensory needs. So once I've developed that kind of clear picture of the child and what I've found when I've used this with settings is they are so much more optimistic and so much more proactive in identifying strategies that are then child centered. So rather than focusing on how do I just fix this issue or correct this problem, it's more about them thinking more broadly about their provision about their adult-child interactions, about how they provoke the child's development, about how they honour and affirm them. So the celebratory framework is kind of one of the biggest um, practical strategies that I give as a really good starting point. Once you've got a celebratory framework on the go, you will notice that you expand so much of your um, own pedagogy and understanding of difference. Do you want me to jump onto another one or? Well, please do. I'm, I'm thinking about that framework and, and the way in which it can be used in practice. Is it an individual tool uh, or is it something that's worth doing as a staff team? Of course, we will link that uh, in the podcast notes for listeners at the end. So I've seen it used in loads of ways. I didn't think it would take off the way it did because I just used it as an accountability measure for myself because I used to work as a local authority consultant. And, and what I will say is I'm always very open that I was horrifically ableist as an area senko. I would go out and I would observe and I would identify problems and I would put them in an intervention. And and then I realized actually that I wasn't helping in that situation. And I, and I started to really hold myself accountable and thinking, actually, um, how am I empowering children within settings and educators? And so I've seen it used as a training tool. So, you know, in a team meeting, picking a child and actually talking about them in relation to the celebratory framework and then thinking about actually how does this then translate into practice? I've seen it used with individual children. I, I've seen people use it as a, as a uh, um, pedagogical documentation. So actually I do provide like a tool you can use, uh, which can be found within a, a, a number of um, projects that I've worked on recently. So you can use it in a myriad of ways. The biggest impact is how we talk about children. So when you're speaking to a parent, actually use me celebratory framework. Don't just jump to the problem. Talk about you know, what you like about the child, what they're interested in and, and what their strengths are. So it kind of resets us from that deficit narrative. And it does, it makes a huge, huge difference. It's so, so insightful. There was some um, research by the Froebel Trust in 2019, really, really an important piece of research. And what they, they were actually looking at digital documentation, but what they actually found is they were looking at where do we target our observational attention? So when we're in our earlier settings and we're observing children, who gets the most observational attention? And what they basically found, it was a small scale study, but I think really telling is that it was those children that engaged in traditional ways of playing and learning. So, you know, the children that were most vocal, the children that produce work, um, the children that were more passive, so would be indoors and kind of, you know, you could track them easier. And all the characteristics of those children receiving less observational attention were those children who would fall under the category of SEN. So, you know, children who spoke less, children who were less reliant on adults, children who preferred to be outdoors, which is a notorious known thing about neurodivergent children. They don't like to be contained. And it was really sad because what this study found is that all these golden threads of learning are being missed because we're just not looking at these children. And that comes back to what I was saying earlier on in that if we see them as a problem, then we're not going to look for the learning. And there was some really good Scandinavian research. And, and the key thing that stood out to me in that research is it was kind of a call to action. And it said, we have to prioritize going forward, repositioning children traditionally identified as SEN. We have to reposition them as problems back to learners because they are active learners. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know if I've answered the question, but basically give those children observational attention. Um, and, and, 
Another practical tip is that if you are doing observations on children who have developmental differences, look at the ratio of concern-based observations versus learning-based observations, and you will likely find you're noting down more concerns than you are learning experiences, and we need to make sure that that's more balanced so that we've got, again, that more holistic perspective of the child. Yeah, that, that 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 framework of assessment is so important for for grasping the child the child's needs in, a, in an affirmative way. So, so thank you for sharing that, and thank you for sharing that initial insight on, um, I guess your your previous practice as as a speech and language therapist. I think back to my own practice practice as an earliest practitioner all those years ago, and perhaps it wasn't as good as it, as it should have been. But it's that critical reflection that's so important in, in constantly developing. And we will, of course, get it wrong along the way, but um, as long as we're seeking out those sources of support. Uh, that for people is really, really important. And I think you mentioned just say, um, um, that idea that, that neurodivergent children like to be out, outdoors all the time. Um, and although that can be true to an extent, perhaps that might be a, a myth that's perhaps often perpetuated uh, sometimes. I'm just wondering about that and other myths that we often hear around neurodivergent children. There's there's lots of myths. And so, yeah, actually on reflection, and as as you can see, I do it myself sometimes where I get excitable about research and then I I do apply it to all. So I think the the first thing to recognise is that any... Um, neurotype is not homogenous. What we know is that there is a high variation of difference amongst different neurotypes. So um, I, I really dislike that cliched saying about if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. The reason I dislike it is because you can apply that to any human. If you've met one Shaddai, you have met one Shaddai. So it's, but I think that the core of that message is get to know the individual recognize their neurotype as well as part of their their way of being um but what we can sometimes do is we can kind of have a a a broad brush stroke so all children who are autistic are going to have you know savant skills or special interests and it's not always the way so i think recognizing um that variation of difference and yeah, some of the common myths, I think, obviously, the, the big one that I will often talk about is this empathy or this um, deficit of empathy. It's a big, a big autistic myth um, that one of kind of the key indicators or early indicators of autism is a lack of empathy. It originates from the work of Simon Baron Cohen. Um yeah, so less said there, but basically he did research where he identified um, that children who are autistic ha- display or demonstrate less levels of empathy. Now, there is an increasing body of autistic-led research that has actually found, yes, autistic people can have lower empathy and, and different types of lower empathy, but actually there's also the other side of the story where you might actually see hyper-empathy in some autistic people. They might not traditionally display empathy in the way that you would see it in a neurotypical individual, but you might see it in other ways. So to draw upon my own example, as a child, I didn't necessarily have much empathy for other humans but for animals and objects. So I personify all objects. They have a um, pronoun, they have an identity. I become extremely attached, I get sad about them. Some people would find that really peculiar, but it shows I do have empathy. I just wouldn't necessarily get the same emotional feelings towards another person, but I do still have empathy towards objects and animals. Um, And so that is often experienced as hyper-empathy. Um, equally, you can just have, you know, um, neutral bouts of it. So it's, but it's this idea of we have this piece of research and that becomes the dominant narrative rather than going, well, actually, there'll be other sides to that story. And that's where I mentioned earlier on that sometimes what we've got to really recognize as educators is that when we are being given these evidence-based um, pieces of research, we have always got to ask, is it bias? Is it representative? Are there myths that can be drawn upon this? I think something that we know can happen in early childhood is we can run away with things. So I don't know if anybody remembers the years of black and white baby rooms because of some research around high contrast patterns. And then a few years later, it was like, actually, high contrast patterns in black and white are only kind of prevalent in the first three months of life. After that, 
it is, you know, it expands much further. So do we really need high contrast black and white areas? So I know that's obviously not neurodivergence based, but just to highlight the point of we can sometimes run away with research and then change all our pedagogies instead of going, hang on, let's think about how this is applicable and applying it in a responsible way. And that's the same with neurodivergent research. A lot of the research that practitioners will be exposed to is research that takes the medicalized and pathology-based paradigm, which looks at how do we eliminate or correct this way of being. And so like another big practical tip is, are you following neurodivergent-led research that is actually pioneered by autistic, ADHD, dyslexic, disabled, bipolar? Are we actually drawing upon research, particularly those lived experience narratives as well? Um, and what we do know is that that is an increasing area which is becoming really well known and there are so many theories being born out of these areas of research that are going to absolutely expand so much of what we know about child development which is so so exciting it, like it's it really is exciting some of the research that we're starting to understand about how young children develop but is it being given the platform to be understood and again i would argue not at the moment we don't cover it in early childhood mm, yeah I would, I would i would agree with you absolutely there there carrie you know it's those experiences of neurodivergent children people that can teach you know, typical people a, a lot about the ways in which we live our lives and the ways in which our, our experience is often framed by these very narrow forms of being and, and becoming. So you know, it's really fundamental that we learn from those experiences of neurodivergent children and people and um, you know, use them to rethink our own habits and, and ways of living that we have in, in everyday life. What other sources of support then might, might practitioners turn to? I'm just thinking about those conversations with parents in particular um, that can be anxiety raising, that can be vulnerable. Uh, in those moments and when practitioners are beginning to think about having those conversations, what other sources of support would you recommend they turn to? So I think using what you have got, because again, I know obviously I've been somewhat critical of, of the mainstream documents. You still use those. Those are still valuable, but use those as a springboard and then actually look upon and draw upon neurodivergent led organisations. I think one of the big things that aliens can benefit from at the moment is advocacy and community-based work. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, I tend to say that social media, similar to in the 90s when neurodiversity kind of emerged, is similar situation that we're in now is that there are so many accounts on social media that are doing so much advocacy work. So for example, um, I follow a lot of, there's a lot of American accounts actually, um, speech and language accounts that are changing the way we think about autistic and other neurodivergent communication. So for example, meaningful speech, um, I would say any educator needs to be following the work of meaningful speech, which talks about uh, different types of language acquisition that happen in childhood, including gestalt language processing, which is a way that a lot of autistic children learn language and communication. And um, so following adv advocacy based accounts, following neurodivergent people and actually accessing training from those people as well. It's not to say that neurotypical people shouldn't be offering training, not at all, but I think that you have to be mindful that we have an issue in early childhood and education that the messages that are then given are often inaccurate and they take the deficit approach. So when you are seeking um, support and training, actually thinking about are the people who have these experiences um, involved in actually how this is then produced? So I know a lot of people do come to me for training because they know I'm autistic and ADHD. They're going to get that lived experience perspective and then also know that I am invested in changing the narrative around those, those neurotypes. So making sure that, you know, social media, access and training, that it is either run by neurodivergent people or there is a clear allyship to neurodivergent people. You can see the voice of those individuals. Um, 
there are so many tools and resources that are being developed. I'm trying to think. So, um, you know, for example, there is an uh, organization called Autism Level Up. Um, it is directed at autistic children, but I think any child will benefit from it. And rather than looking at feelings, it actually looks at our energy levels and how our energy and our interoception, so how our feelings feel within the body, it helps um, educators to really help children to think about their energy when they're in the early years setting. And they've got a whole suite of resources. The Anna Freud organization, they're doing a lot of work around neurodiversity. I've recently produced a guide for them. Tapestry um, are doing a lot of work around neurodiversity. So there are organizations that are coming forward and actually really wanting to produce things for the sector that are informed by people with that lived experience, both from just a personal lived experience, but also from a, an evidence formed experience as well. Yeah, I think I think it's brilliant to see a, a long overdue wealth of knowledge and resources now being available to support practitioners. And what you say there about developing that community of understanding amongst practitioners is really important so that they know their work is, is not isolated and they're not working in silos, but also developing that critical eye towards the training that they see, given that there is so much uh, information and advice out there on social media, um, and not all of it will be, be equal. Um, so it's really about practitioners themselves having that critical understanding of what the best advice is and uh, being wary of approaches to you know, perpetuate a deficit approach. But there's been a smorgasbord of kind of practical tips and advice in this episode, so that's a lovely place to end it. Thank you very much, Karen. I would like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Kerry, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Shadai Tembo and Kerry Murphy. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, don't forget you can sign up via the link in the episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your settings and links to relevant resources.